É o que? Ixtoixkanatani. <laughs> Very cold dawn this 10th day of October 2019 in the first half of Awakatsuki on the Deer Moon, which is a summer moon, believe it or not. And as you can see, this morning, after uh, a week that grew colder and colder, it has finally iced out over the pond here at Shpopikimi. There's no waterfowl. Beavers are still working, maintaining these bits of open water. Um, I think one of them was either a beaver or muskrat was checking us out just a couple of seconds ago. Um, but yeah, I've been monitoring as I, as I talked about in my last video, I said I was gonna monitor the beaver lodge and the beaver activity um, because it looked to me like they're building this, this, uh, this used to be a scent mound and it's growing quite large now. And they always do, you know, when they're, when they're building um, their, their winter food cache, which is this raft here uh, for the winter. It's not really a raft, it's attached all the way down into the muck. But usually they carve out, you know, a big canal here. And uh, every winter they gotta kind of recarve that canal and the material that they bring up, they're bringing up onto the scent mound. And they always do bring some of that material up onto the scent mound, but typically they also bring it up onto their lodge. Um, now things were dry, so dry this year that their lodge, as you can see, is still like half on shore in the wet meadows, um, which in a good year, it's, it's really not on shore <laughs> anymore. Um, I just saw on my walk in this morning, coyote crossing over the uh, golf course. I think I might've got a clip of him. I don't know how well it'll turn out in this, in this phone um, that I'm using, but <laughs> I saw a coyote and that's the first time I've seen a coyote here in a while. He must be smelling the heck out of these beavers and their activities here as they scamper to get ready for for uh, an early winter. <laughs> but that's also danger for them when their lodge is, like I say, half on shore. Um, so I'm just kind of keeping an eye on things and see how they develop. I don't think that they've built, you know, this, uh, <laughs> it's funny trying to, trying to use the screen, um, you know, to indicate my arm feels like it should be going this way, hey, and it should be going this way. Anyway, uh, I don't think that their little scent mound is big enough yes, yet to house them for the winter. This is a, this is a significant beaver family. Um, but I think they were going in that direction and this week it's gonna warm up to highs of five degrees above zero. <laughs> so maybe they'll still uh, be able to continue their efforts, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll continue monitoring. Anyway, welcome to my Thursday and figured I'd take the camera along with me this day and show you uh, what's, what's happening. No skunk calls this morning no raccoon calls, nothing in traps. I've got all of my traps pretty much out there. I've got a, a few small traps left, um, but almost all of them are out there. I have to go set uh, one of my last larger trap. I'm going to go set up for a porcupine um, a little bit later this morning on the extreme south end of town. But, um, but all week, yeah, it's been very quiet. Um, I think I had maybe in the, in the week, maybe one skunk call and you know that was that so the animals are not liking this cold either <laughs> and i don't blame them i'm gonna go get out of it right now take you over to the office maybe um or we'll see we'll see where uh, where the camera turns up next Just out for a midday supply run slash trap setting slash poly walk slash lunch. <laughs> lunch consisting of a two day old steak that's waiting for me in the fridge and I'm just about to grab when I drop off poly and I'll eat that on the road. Um, earlier, before I came here to walk poly, 
I went off and set a trap for a porcupine. Not often do I set traps for porcupines. Usually I just catch them with the uh, with a catch pole. But this guy's kind of evasive, so um, showing up at night and people are worried about their trees and such, such. So I put a trap out there with apples, like I cut an apple in half, put a little salt on there, and we'll see if we can catch him up. I hate to, I hate to mess around with porcupines, but, um, but I do think they're the kind of animal that I can easily move to another section of coolies and they'll get by in the coolies. They're not so synanthropic as the skunks and raccoons um, that I have to feel too bad dropping them off outside of quote-unquote civilization <laughs> anyway um after setting that trap which just was a, a quick thing on the deep south side of town where i need to be because that's where the craft store is as well um stopped by the craft store and uh star my instructor for the jewelry unit had been there just before me picking out the last of our supplies for jewelry making because next week we switch gears and we go on to uh, moccasin craft. So I think all of us admin, instructors and clients, uh, artisans alike, all of us are kind of recognizing that, um, you know, when you look at our board, our inventory of jewelry, and realize this is two thousand dollars of investment in supplies not all of it has been used by by far yet um and and maybe what's on the board represents half of what was made because i know you know some people are keeping some of the best stuff uh for themselves and <laughs> tucking it away maybe saving it um we're supposed to have an end of term in march um what do you call it like a like a symposium kind of thing we're calling it a trade show but it, we're going to invite all kinds of uh indigenous artists local and otherwise artists and, and craft craftsmen uh to bring their stuff and host a big a big show a big swap meet of of native arts and crafts here um that's that's one of our big outcomes in fact is to make that happen and so um we're starting to realize that Oh, six months to build a big, you know, inventory to, to have a, a really full booth or two at the, the trade show that we're going to host. Six months even is not that much time. Come here, Polio. Let's take off your uh, your little hook so you can go in. Yeah, Mr. Polio here. He's ready to go inside. Come on in. Come in in a minute. Um... Anyway, yeah, six months is not a lot of time. And even, you know, for what we had planned, we were thinking, well, maybe we'll start selling some right away. Um, put up a, a storefront here at the, at the facility anyway. Um, and then uh, participate in like Christmas craft shows and those kind of things, local stuff. But looking at our inventory, I don't think we're going to be able to do that. I think we need to save it for our own trade show um, to put up a good front when that comes. And yeah, <laughs> six months is not a lot of time and this winter is going to go quick for us, I think. Anyway, switching on to moccasins by next week. Uh, I also picked up on my, on my run this afternoon, stopped by the post office and picked up a new t-shirt press hey for uh, rattlesnakes of lethbridge that was a personal pur purchase but i'm gonna bring it down to the training facility um in case some of the some of the artisans want to start making t-shirts of their own you know um when i do a when i do a run of t-shirts which i'm gonna do and probably i'll be taking pre-orders for the new rattlesnakes of lethbridge t-shirts with a with a new with a second logo um, one you haven't seen on a t-shirt before, uh, but still featuring calf shirt, the old, the old time rattlesnake wrangler from the blood tribe. Um, and still a, an artwork by Margie Cropbeard Wolf. Anyway, the new t-shirts are going to be coming out probably by Christmas time. Uh, well, for sure before Christmas time. So I'm going to be taking pre-orders. I'm not sure what I'm charging yet, but probably about 25 bucks a shirt. Um, I should be able to get this time. XLs and double XLs at least. I've found uh, 
uh, places where I can get that. So I'll be taking pre-orders of color preference, size, um, maybe by maybe by my next video if I'm if I'm pretty confident in the price of 25 bucks a shirt or so, uh, I'll put it out there. But yeah, going to be making some new t-shirts and what else? I don't know. I should go back to work. <laughs> go unload the press uh, over there at the at the facility and and show you how things are progressing there. Okay, so here is my nearly complete silk screen press. I just have to install this receiving plate tomorrow um, that you put the t-shirts on. I just didn't have a, a Phillips screwdriver to do that with here. But this attaches ultimately to this, this little sleeve box here that can roll up and down this arm so that I can position um, you know, this plate further away from the press or closer as I, as I want, you know, I can adjust this. Uh, it's just some little Allen screws that, that I can use to adjust this really nice and tight. So yeah, this will go on tomorrow. And I, I think I'll just call it the receiving platform because it doesn't necessarily have to be t-shirts that go on here. You know, if you want to, you could put cardboard, you poster board, plastic, um, leather, glass, uh, you know, a host of other, anything you could lay flat that you could silk screen on, you can use this press. So it's, it's pretty versatile. I'm gonna use it, you know, of course, first for t-shirts, but I could, I could foresee doing something else with it down the road, some posters or something. Any case, um, once this board is installed and everything, uh, how this works is I can have up to four different silk screens on here, um, each representing a different color for the design. So I can have a design with as many as four different colors if I want. Um, usually I just use black, so I'm just gonna be probably using one end. And it looks like um, there's a joint on the other side of the unit here, such that I could set up another station in the future. I could probably just buy the station and this additional arm and hook onto the other side to, so that you can have two working stations. Any case, um, once my silk screen is in here, then you can pull the arm down, and um, of course, this the platform will be here, so the arm will come kind of meet the platform and have the have the screen out here. So you do your squeegeeing, you know, and then um, then you can release the silk screen back up and blow dry your t-shirt, peel it off, put another shirt on, keep the production going. So um, I have the other materials, the paints, the screens, the, the emulsion fluid that you have to put on there to, to make the design. Um, I've got all the other equipment coming. Um, I gotta buy the t-shirts, but 
I think pretty soon I can be in operation. I brought it down here to my training facility um, so that the artisans, the students can also use it. I think I promised that I would show like the progress of their, uh, of their jewelry making here. But I know a lot of it's not really represented on the board, but you can take a look anyway. And here's some of the, some of the materials that the students slash artisans have made. Some of the students are really teaching us <laughs> or teaching their fellow students. There's actually a lot more necklaces, I know. There's a lot more of these kind of bone necklaces and stuff um, tucked away somewhere in here. Uh, and you can see some of the guys are working. Oh, like here's a big pile of them right here. These are all different completed necklaces. Um, I know the guys are working on some chokers and stuff. So cool things happening. But like I said, we're going to be switching over to moccasins next week. Uh, right now I'm going to close shop. Well, it's already like after hours. I've just stayed so I could build my, my t-shirt station. But, um, now I'm going to take off. I'm going to go over to one of the nearby schools where we are having a dinner. Uh, it's a dinner for parents of First Nations, Métis and Inuit students. So I'm going to go check that out with Chelsea and the kids and we'll see what else unfolds tonight. just home from the FNMI night, which was interesting. It was held at the gym in the Victoria Parks High School, which is where my daughter Justine went to high school. So there was some memories and such in those halls and on those surrounding streets. And it was nice to see some of the people that turned up. It wasn't a large gathering. <laughs> Uh, I expected actually quite a few more people given that there is a, a significant FNMI population in the Lethbridge school districts, but uh, it is what it is. And I really, I thought it was going to be a dinner dinner and so did Chelsea, like a roast and that kind of thing, but uh, it turned out to be kind of pizza and chips and <laughs> a few veggies. Um, and I don't know, it, the the host... Uh, when I got there was John Chief Calf, and he basically just put some ideas out there, right? Just let them float out there. And um, he was talking about the importance of language. And he showed a little video clip where uh, there was a social scientist who was discussing the, you know, the difference, the cognitive difference between peoples who um relate to direction in terms of the, you know, the cardinal directions and they keep that in their minds all the time. Like there's places, there's uh, groups in, I think she said Australia where, um, your, your basic greeting with somebody is, is aware you go in and you have to have the answer in terms of, uh, your cardinal directions, where you're headed and such, you know, North and Northeast and what have you. Um, and you just have to know where that is all the time. And she asked in the in the video, and I, you know, said, "Close your eyes. Which way is the southeast right now?" <laughs> you know, and most of us don't have that in our heads, but some languages, um, you know, utilize those directions a lot, and people are very conscious of it. You know, I know uh, the elders that that I was trained by were always very conscious not always speaking of the directions but they're always conscious of it um where i grew up i was quite conscious of the of the directions because i was in a valley that ran north and south and it was very easy to keep my uh my cognitive direction uh, but here you know even though I, we can see the mountains from lethbridge when i'm in the inner urban environment i'm not always aware of you know where they are and so I don't know. I get discombobulated. Anyway, he put this idea out there about, you know, may, maybe languages are important for uh, thinking reasons. And then he showed a video. Um, well, he made us watch the entire, I shouldn't say make, because it wasn't like torture or anything. 
but uh, we watched the entire movie Circle of the Sun, which is only about a half hour long movie from the 1950s with um, some of the, the people who I knew, some of my friends, uh, Marie Marulli, the late Marie Marulli sh shows up a couple of times in there. It's really nice to see her. Um, got me thinking maybe I should go to Pop's Pub once in a while in the afternoon and just have a, a glass of wine um, like I used to with her, you know, just to, uh, just in memory. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, you know, we watched the movie and the theme of that movie was in that time, you know, Pete and a lot of people, Pete was a young man and, and he thought he didn't belong in, you know, in the traditional culture. And, uh, and the prediction was that the Sundance was gonna end. Like we were seeing there, he was, Pete was, wis you know, witness to the last vestiges of his culture, which is not at all the case. Um, you know, the reality was that, uh, that, you know, Pete was alive during the time, he was maturing during a time of a, a revitalization that's continued to this day. And that now the, the cer ceremonies and societies and stuff are much stronger than they were when Pete was around. <laughs> they kind of went the opposite. So we watched the mo that movie and then we came back to, um, you know, say a few words. And uh, I, I, John had us kind of meet and greet each other and stuff, kind of mingle. And But before he put us out there to mingle, he put the this idea out there that, you know, what we saw in the movie, uh, even though it's it's a different era and stuff, um, there's some of the same same issues. And I don't know if he was meaning to direct my mind toward, you know, the language thing, but that's what it did for me was because he opened with language and then he showed the language video and then he showed Pete's video. Uh, my mind, of course, put the, connect the dots and says, um, maybe Blackfoot language is not gonna die. Maybe that prediction that we're making is much like the, the death of the Sundance prediction. Um, back in Pete's day. Although where the re revitalization is happening, I'm not seeing it yet in a strong way, but <laughs> who knows? Anyway, um, Chelsea and the kids went to Humpty's to get a few more bites to eat because uh, the kids didn't really like any of the fare over over at the, uh, at the dinner. So they're probably having waffles or something now <laughs> i'm gonna chill out here with poli derek wait for them to come home and this could be the end of my video i don't know maybe there'll be some family clip to end who knows Hi. hey are you recording me yeah but i can't even hardly see you in here let's turn the lights on yeah you guys should go into bed right Oh my God. I know it's so dark. Well, we're going to sleep. Well, 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 well,